There are a ton of different salts out there, and it seems like the prettier they are, the more expensive they become. The question is, do any of these salts really make a difference? Are any of them better for your health? Are they worth the money? I'm gonna answer these questions today, here on A Warehouse Chef. When I was a kid, it was my father's dream to move back to Greece. And he had just opened up our business, the Hellenic Snack Bar and Restaurant. It was a little tiny restaurant that we opened in 1976, and it just started to blossom. So we did move to Greece, and we would come back in the summers because the restaurant was busy, and it was also our livelihood. I am forever enamored by the fact that we can forget what we had for breakfast, but we will never forget a particular scent or a particular flavor. The one thing I distinctly remember about living in Greece was this little family-owned restaurant that was right on the water. A father and two sons would go out fishing in the morning. Whatever they caught, that would be on the menu for dinner. When they ran out of fish, the restaurant shut down. It's pretty cool. The fish was almost always served charbroiled, and it only had a couple of ingredients, olive oil, oregano, and salt. And I used to pick at this fish meticulously. My uncle used to watch me. He used to say to me, man, you really, really like to have fish. And I said to him, I, said, I don't know, I, when I eat fish back home, because we lived on Long Island and there was an abundance of seafood, but it just never tasted like the fish that we used to eat in Greece. It was, it's a little more bland. It had a little less dimension. So my uncle takes the fish head off of his plate and he puts it onto my plate and he points at the head with the fork and there were clusters of white spots on it, which was basically dehydrated salt. And he said to me, the salt in your water is different than the salt in our water. Ours is better. I never forgot that. But really, isn't salt just sodium chloride? I mean, does it really make a difference what type of salt you add to your food? I purchased a few salts here and we're gonna go over them with a little bit of detail and see how they fare. Now, first of all, sodium chloride is really, really interesting. In its purest form, salt has this crazy crystalline structure. It actually makes a perfect square. If you were to look at a salt molecule underneath a microscope, it would be just that, a perfect square. I was taught this parlor trick when I was a kid. It was kind of cool. You take a regular salt shaker like this one and you would challenge someone to balance it on its edge like that. Probably work better with a cutting board. Get a really flat surface. You challenge someone to take the salt, see if they could balance it on its edge and it never worked until you would take the salt and you would add, you would take some of the salt, put it on the table and you'd kind of wedge it into the salt a little bit like that and just gently get into position because the flatness of the salt because it's a perfect square would actually create a surface enough where you could balance it on its edge. It actually worked a lot better in the 70s. Now salt has really come a long way since I was a kid. This is your classic table salt. It's kind of the stuff I grew up with. And you could buy this either iodized or not. Years ago, people lacked iodine and that caused some serious health issues. So what they did was they added iodine to salt because salt was an ingredient that was added to almost every single type of food. So what's the difference between table salt and sea salt? They're just harvested differently. Table salt usually comes from salt mines. We find giant salt deposits in the ground, we pump water down, we create a salt slurry, and then we suck that out. China is the largest producer of salt in the world. They do roughly 40 metric tons a year, and of that, very little is almost used for food consumption. Before industrialization, salt used to be extremely expensive. It used to be harvested by hand. It was a very, very difficult process. As a matter of fact, the Romans used to use salt as currency. Back in the day, there was no refrigeration. So if you wanted to keep your harvest like your meat, you really had to cure it in salt. So it was absolutely necessary to have. The British decided to industrialize the salt harvesting process. And just like everything else, there was competition. And who had the best salt? Well, the guy who had the whitest salt. Just like the guy who made the whitest flour. White is the driven snow. Not necessarily the healthiest, but in its purest form, Salt is white. Pure sodium chloride is white. So here we have three types of generic salt, which we're all kind of familiar with. This is a very popular brand in America. It's called Morton. And this here is Morton's iodized salt. This is a store-bought salt, like a generic uh, supermarket brand. And this is Morton's sea salt. Now, here's a really interesting thing. See, salt used to just be just that, salt. But 
when it's humid, salt gets solidified, and that's a big problem. What do people do? They get upset. They can't pour the salt out of the salt shaker because it's all clumpy. You've had that happen. As a matter of fact, one of the ways that you keep that from happening is by adding rice grains to the salt. You add the rice grains to the salt, and it absorbs the moisture in the salt, and it keeps the moisture from clumping up the salt. What Morton decided to do was incorporate anti-caking agents into the salt, calcium silicate. If you look at the ingredients on this thing, it actually has dextrose in it, which is sugar. So this isn't even really salt 100%. This is like sugar and anti-caking agents, and then has the potassium iodide. But man, that's just not cool. It's got chemicals in it. So even though the salt is a little bit more expensive, it's probably because of the branding, it's also more expensive because they add all this extra chemicals to it. This supermarket salt in here doesn't have sugar in it, but it has yellow prussiate of soda. I don't know what that is, and I'm not sure if it's any good for you. Interesting thing, Morton's natural sea salt, one ingredient, sea salt, that's it. It is double the money from regular salt, probably because of the harvesting process. This here is kosher salt, it's just a coarser salt. The finer the salt is, the easier it dissolves in water. But you gotta be really careful. You can't just substitute kosher salt with regular salt when you're going by recipe. Check this out. Th that was a tablespoon. I zeroed out my scale on it. If you take a tablespoon of kosher salt and you weigh it out, it weighs nine grams. Let's take a tablespoon of regular salt. It's 19 grams. See the, see the difference? Even though they're the same weight by mass, there's a lot less space between the salt particles in the table salt, and that makes it much heavier. So you can't just substitute. You have to go by weight. If the recipe calls for kosher salt, don't add table salt, you'll make it too salty. So these three salts here were table salts, including the kosher salt. They do sell kosher sea salt as well. Now this one here, the Malden, the Malden salt is a finishing salt. It is a sea salt. It's very big, it's very flaky. It's something you would put on top of your dish. Like if you were serving a steak and you wanted to have a little crunch and you wanted to showcase the salt, you would use Malden salt. If you were making like a chocolate dessert and you wanted to put a little sea salt on it, a little flaky salt on it, Malden salt. You also have inexpensive regular sea salt, which we saw the Morton salt is an inexpensive sea salt. Sea salt is just dehydrated water from the sea. These two salts here are French salts. This is just your standard light gray French salt. And this one here is like the prized possession of French salt. It's called Fleur de Sel, I think. I can't really pronounce it that well. Fleur de Sel, Fleur de Sel. When the salt pond dehydrates, the salt particles that are on the top of the pond happen to be just a touch lighter in color, and they also have to be, they also happen to be smaller. So the cream of the crop is really what's taken off the top, and that's called fleur de sol. But why is it gray? It's gray because it comes from the water and the water has other minerals in it. And that brings me to my absolute favorite sea salt, the one I use all the time, the one I love, Celtic sea salt. None of this is sponsored. I purchased all of these salts with my own money, except this one, I stole this one, it was very expensive. Full disclosure. There are links down below. You click on one of those links, it takes you to one of these salts on Amazon, and if you buy that salt, I receive a small commission. That's called an affiliate link. Now, if you would go to Amazon without clicking on the link down below and find the same exact salt, the price would be exactly the same. I love Celtic sea salt, and you wanna know why? Because I'm a Because it makes my food, especially my seafood, tastes like it did when I had seafood in Greece. Let's take a look at the breakdown of the salt online. Table salt is usually 39% sodium. Check it out. Celtic sea salt only has 33% sodium. Celtic sea salt contains other trace elements and minerals in it. A nutritionist once told me that Celtic sea salt is loaded with electrolytes, but looking at the average daily recommended values, the amount of trace elements and minerals present in Celtic sea salt is on the order of hundreds times less than the necessary daily value. Now compared to run of the mill salts, Celtic sea salt is far healthier for you. It doesn't have any added ingredients, no anti-caking agents, no crap in it. But I'm also buying it because it tastes amazing and it make, it gives my food this awesome pop. So we've gone from table salts to sea salts and now we're gonna go to one of the more famous, prettiest salts out there, Himalayan pink salt. Now Himalayan pink salt is also called Himalayan sea salt a lot. You see them interchanged online quite often. I'm no geography buff, but I'm 
sure there's no oceans in the Himalayan mountains. Himalayan sea salt is mined in Pakistan, in Punjab. Now, I know you really want your Himalayan sea salt to come from a place like this, but it doesn't. The root of Himalayan sea salt is said to have come from dehydrated oceans that once were at the base of the Himalayan mountains. But that would still not make it a sea salt. That would make it a mine salt. The Himalayan sea salt that I have here, I bought from Costco, and there isn't really much nutritional information on the label. Online, you find out that Himalayan sea salt is 96 to 99% sodium chloride, and there is a significant amount of iodine in it, so that's kind of good. Here I am, I go online to buy all these salts to show you the differences, and I come across two Hawaiian salts, black salt, red salt, and that's where I got suckered. They're certainly eye-catching, but a closer look at the label reveals something very disappointing. There is salt that comes from Hawaii that's infused with charcoal that comes from lava. Right, it's also very expensive and kind of hard to come by. This stuff is Hawaiian style, and there's ingredients on the back that say Pacific Ocean sea salt and activated charcoal. The red salt, it's actually made in Washington, and the Red stuff is clay that does come, supposedly comes from Hawaii. It's a laying salt, which means it's infused with a laying clay. Neither one of these products is genuinely dehydrated from the water that's on the coast of Hawaii. Even though I feel like I got scammed, maybe they taste good. Let's give them a try. So I'm taking these four slices of tomatoes. One tomato is gonna have table salt on it. The other one, red Hawaiian salt. The third, black Hawaiian salt, and the fourth, my favorite, Celtic sea salt. I'm gonna taste them blindfolded and see if one is more appealing to me than the other. Okay, so I'm here with my wife, Maria. You've seen her in other videos. What I want you to do, Maria, is I want you to feed me the tomatoes randomly. I'm gonna taste them, and then I'm gonna try to figure out which tomatoes, without looking at them, have which salt on them. You are such a dick. <laughs> You want to do this? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I don't know how, just bring it close to me. Just guide me towards one. I have no idea what's going on here. Tomato number one. Oh, oh you're handing it to me? Yeah, okay, all right. Yes. Okay, you remember the order, right? Yes. All right. Tomato number two. Okay. Okay. Tomato number three. Okay. And tomato number four. So I really like the flavor of tomato number three the most. Tomato number two had the least amount of salt. And tomato number four was just really kind of like you could tell. I almost feel like tomato number four was the table salt. Wrong. Um, what was it? It was the pink salt, mm -hmm. then the table salt. Mm -hmm. Then this Celtic sea salt. What did I say? That was my favorite, right? Number three, yeah. yeah. And then the black lava salt. Right, and I, we did not plan this in, ad, in advance. No planning so, in advance. So yeah, so I mean, honestly, I really do love the taste of Celtic sea salt. The other salts, you know, they tasted about the same. I mean, I didn't measure how much salt I put on each one to know the difference, but the Celtic sea salt definitely did stand out. I'd like to make an honorable mention here to one of my other favorite salts from Greece, which kind of gives me that flavor of Greek fish when I had it in Greece, and this is called Kalos. There's a link to it down below. It won't break the bank, and I kind of like this sea salt. It's one of my sea salts that I go to. The second go-to salt that I use often is Himalayan salt. Even though it's made in Pakistan, I don't care. When I put that salt in food, it adds a dimension to it, and I like it. Not as much as the Celtic sea salt, but it's not that bad. Look, it's pretty obvious that I lean towards Celtic sea salt. If you want to stick to just table salt, say regular, these fancier salts or the sea salts are not in your budget, just make sure that you buy a salt that has nothing in it but salt. And if it cakes on you, well, then you just add some rice granules to it in the summer. Don't be putting unnecessary chemicals and crap in your body. Try out the different salts and see which one is best for you, which one really appeals to your palate. When you narrow that down, that's the salt you should stick with. Now the black and red salts here, they're impressive to look at. It'd be kind of cool if you had them on a the table with a little tiny spoon so you can impress your guests, but I would not purchase them. I have not had the privilege of tasting authentic Hawaiian salts that have been harvested in Hawaii and look like this naturally. 
If I do, I will do a video and I will let you know about that. I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to wish you the best of health and happiness, especially in 2021. So eat healthy, save money, and cook like a pro. And I'll see you again really soon. Thank you. Thank you.